In my last video, I created a neural network that can guess the Counter-Strike map based on a given image. In the comments, a user asked whether you could use a similar approach to apply this in the real world, but to predict the location of an image. Technically, yes, and I found a project here on YouTube that somewhat achieves this for the area of the United States. But doing some napkin math, you would need an unbelievable amount of data and computing power for a generalized solution that works accurately and worldwide. So I settled for the next best thing, predicting the location in Counter-Strike. Basically, you input an image into a neural network and receive the coordinates as outputs. But first, we have to gather some data. If you are new to machine learning, I need labeled data, meaning image and information pairs, for the machine learning model to be able to learn. For the last project, I already gathered a decently sized dataset of Counter-Strike images. However, since the labels just contain the map name, I sadly can't reuse them for this project. Even worse, I can't even use the same capture method, where I executed auto-generated console scripts directly in-game, because I have no way of controlling the file names there. Luckily, I stumbled over Source2 Viewer, which is an open source project that can open Source2 resource files, including Counter-Strike 2 maps. It also contains a viewer for map files, where you get a pretty accurate representation of what they are looking like in-game, and you can control a camera to fly around in them. But the best part, it's written in C-sharp, the language I've worked with for most of my professional career, so I was on home turf. I quickly forked the repository and looked at its code. It was very well written, but the part I was interested in interfaced with OpenGL, and I hadn't worked with that since my master thesis, and never before in C-sharp. After some tinkering though, I was able to control the camera and set it to a location I wanted by pressing a button. I also implemented a screenshot function, which would take the OpenGL buffer and write it to a JPEG file. And since I was right in the code, I could grab the camera information and the currently loaded map name and put it in the screenshot's file name. Now, all that's left is to sample random locations and view angles within the map bounds I found out in the previous video already, and to write a loop, move the camera, update the screen and take a screenshot. Since I could directly control everything in code, it was much faster than my previous attempt. I could capture 100,000 images within less than one hour. And now all these screenshots contained the exact information I needed for my model. Now I just had to repeat that for all maps. Last time I picked all maps that were available in the casual game mode. But since then a few more maps dropped out and I decided to pick all official maps, including Thera, Mills, Memento, Assembly, Baggage, Shoots and Pool Day. After a while, I ended up with 1.7 million 1024 by 1024 images, which amounted to over 200 gigabytes. And that will be a challenge for my lowly RTX 4080. Here are some more example files. As you can see, the file name contains all the required labeling info. I even included the current pitch and yaw, though I didn't intend to use them for this project. If you're interested in this dataset, good news, because I actually published it for everyone to try out. Check the description to find out how to get it. After that, I pre-split the dataset into 80% train, 10% validation and 10% test sets and started to think about how I want to set up the model. I couldn't just ask the model to predict the coordinates outright, because they were mostly in the range of thousands depending on the map. Most neural networks tend to perform better with normalized data, around the range of 0 to 1 or minus 1 to 1. To my mind came several ways to normalize the coordinates, but some of them had their downsides. Ultimately, I decided on the simplest approach, just scaling everything down by the largest bounds in any map. This happened to be the x-axis on Nuke, a total length of 6500 in-game units. This meant I gave up a bit of precision on the other axes, but at least I have an undistorted normalized space. I had to write a bit of math to get the offset and scaling logic right. Here's a small 2D example. First, we look at the map. Note that it is not centered at 000, but it has an offset. We first shift the center of the map to 000. Then we use the scaling factor from earlier and squish that cube to unit size. The normalized map bounds for Nuke are now in the range of minus 1 to 1 or less, depending on the axis. If you're wondering, why not just squish every map to fit exactly between minus 1 and 1 on all axes? Well, 
Some maps would be horribly distorted and I wanted to make the normalized representations of coordinates as easy to understand for the model as possible. Otherwise it would have to learn how the 3D space for each map works. With that, now I had the data and a way to feed it into the model. For the last project, I used ResNet50, but this time I wanted to go for something more state of the art. ResNet was released all the way back in 2015, and that is basically an eternity for computer vision AI. Many iterations of models came out, for example EfficientNet, which supports larger resolution, better performance and smaller model sizes. But the new kit on the block is the Vision Transformer, the same kind of model architecture which is used in ChatGPT for example. Of course, the one I'm going to be using is several orders of magnitude smaller. Luckily, some libraries provide the base architecture and pre-trained model weights for it, for example Hugging Face Transformers, and it's reasonably easy to set up. The only modification I did was adding a dropout layer to help with overfitting, and a linear layer at the end which produces the X, Y and Z coordinates in normalized space. So basically, image in, XYZ out. After some test runs on a small subset of my data, I also added some random data transformations to combat overfitting. Overfitting basically means that your model is learning the training data by heart and not generalizing to new unseen data. A common strategy is to modify the input data and PyTorch makes it easy with some existing transformations like color changes, mirroring, scaling and so on. However, for this project I couldn't use most of the common ones, as for example flipping or cropping would require a label change as well. I settled on a slight color jitter, random grayscaling and random erasing. Here you can see some examples of what it looks like. The great thing is, it happens fully automatically when your data is being loaded, meaning you don't need to do these modifications on your actual files on the disk. I was now ready to start the full training run. And unlike in my last video, since every epoch now took around two and a half hours, I couldn't just randomly decide to go for any large number of epochs. Each attempt would take a long time to verify. Based on my earlier tests, I ended up picking 30 epochs, meaning around three days for one full training run. But now, let's see the training montage. Actually, let me first explain what you're seeing. The graph shows the distance between the predicted location for an image and its real location. I captured the median, the mean and the 25th and 75th percentile, which you can see here. You are seeing the validation metrics, meaning the model has not seen these images during training. Each metric is accounting for the whole validation set. That means a median distance of 400 would signify that 50% of all images in the validation set are 400 units or less off from the real location. But now let's get back to it. And while the training is running, I wanted to thank everyone for the great feedback and the comments in the last video. And if you enjoyed this video as well, don't forget to subscribe. More projects like this will come out in the future. And now let's look at the results. As I explained, I measured several Euclidean distances between the predicted 3D coordinates and the real ones to get a good feeling of the model performance. I was able to get a median prediction of 96 units off on my test set, data which the model has never seen before. To give you a feeling how much this is, here's an example of me moving 200 units. For reference, the 75th percentile test predictions is at 163, meaning 75% of all predictions are at most 163 units off, but most are more accurate of course. These results were much better than I had anticipated and show that it is indeed possible to predict the location given enough data to train. Here are some examples that worked really well and some that didn't work so well.
Now that I had a working model, I wanted to apply some visualization techniques to see how the model learned the data. And as if the AI overlords at Google somehow knew, I got this video recommended to me on my YouTube homepage right as I was thinking about it. It explains dimensionality reduction techniques and I highly recommend giving it a watch if you're interested. Dimensionality reduction means you take a high dimensional space, like for example the activations of the second last layer of our neural network, and try to represent it in a more manageable amount of dimensions, like 2D or 3D. Crucially, this reduction isn't applied in just any way, but it is attempting to keep points in low dimensional space separated that were also separated in the high dimensional space. I already knew about PCA and TSNE from university, but apparently UMAP is a much more efficient and consistent way of reducing large vector spaces. Conveniently, there's a Python library which fully implements the algorithm, so all I had to do was run the forward pass on some images, throw the activation data into the algorithm and visualize the resulting vectors. This was actually a lot more pain to implement than I thought, mainly because drawing 10,000 images in 3D space is difficult when you don't have any experience in any game engines. I was able to get it working though, and this is the result. To me, it is mesmerizing to fly through the space and to see how the neural network clustered the locations. For example, here you can see the wave from T-spawn in Nuke and follow along the path it takes. In an earlier training run, I trained a multi-head model where the same vision transformer base is used with a classification head to guess the map and the regression head to find the position. The position guessing performance was worse, so the architecture didn't make it into the video, but the resulting UMAP visualization is arguably even more interesting. You can clearly see the map clusters that the model produced, and in most clusters you can explore the walkways. Here's the T-spawn of Italy for example, which is a long dead end that splits into two ways. If you want to explore the data yourself, I created an interactive website. The link is in the description. If you made it until here, thank you so much for watching. This project was a ton of work to put together, so consider subscribing. After my last video, I challenged Tyler Momsen to a subscriber battle, but so far he's winning by a lot. I swear when I wrote this comment he had like 1000 subscribers. But I'll do my best to catch up, so see you in the next one. Oh and one more thing, this video has not been supported by weights and biases. However, it's an awesome tool as I came to find out. In my last video, the first network architecture I picked simply just worked without much experimentation, because image classification is pretty much a solved problem these days. However, for this project it definitely did not work first try. Model after model overfit to the training data or just had poor performance in general. It took me a long time to find a setup that works and halfway along the journey I remembered the old sponsor lines from 2 minute papers and I thought, ugh, let me just check it out. The tool is amazing compared to the manual comparisons I had been doing until that point. You can lock whatever you want and get live data even when you are away from the PC. You can stop runs remotely and apparently you can even automate your hyperparameter search. So if you're working on machine learning tasks, just give it a go. I'll link a playlist in the description where you can learn how to use it within like 15 minutes.